some wonderful news to bring you. Uh, I'm going to bring you a little glimpse of something that has never been seen before, not only in science, but the history of human beings, and perhaps in the history of the cosmos. And it all started when I went down to New Zealand, the land of Middle Earth. Uh, I actually held Gandalf's sword at one point in Wellington. It was a sword called Glamdring because I was declared to be Gandalf the Graying <laughs> by the people at Weta Workshop. So, but before I went there, I did this experiment uh, in a hot spring. I bent over a hot spring and at 90 Celsius breathed in the breath of the earth. And why I was doing that is I'm trying to find out where we came from, where we came from. And I'm going to run a little piece uh, that the New Zealand Herald did, and this will be our introduction. It's just a case of weird science. Leading American scientist Dr. Bruce Damer is at Rotorua's Hell's Gate, conducting research trials aiming to answer the age-old question, how did we get here? It's very exciting. It's a 21st century science, revolutionary science to watch. Uh, if we can find this cycle, it's the engine of creation effectively. Also that we're, we came not from an individual, not from competing individuals, uh, but from a network, a collaborative community, was at the tap root of the tree of life. Dr. Damer's research could turn previous origins of life science on its head. He's testing whether hot springs on land may have been the starting point for life itself. Dr. Damer's searching for RNA, a nucleic acid, and the basis of all living cells. So what we think is that RNA could have been the first polymer that life synthesized first at random in a process like this, and then picked through selection, through these cycling protocells, which we're doing here in the hot spring, picked ones that worked. He's so what I'm gonna show you next has never been seen before because it just came into my phone. It bounced off my phone yesterday. So what you saw me doing there was using chemicals to wet dry cycle in the hot spring to try to tease out the first polymers of life. And in this case, it's called RNA. And this, we got a music soundtrack, an unexpected music soundtrack too. Uh, this is what we found. This little guy here, and this is subject to testing whether this is contamination or not, but we don't think so. That's RNA. That little thread that has the little bumps in it is a building block of life. And it's the first time we've seen this. Normally we just get little smudges on, on gels that tell us that we made something. But this was done with an atomic force microscope in Denmark. And that is a piece of the beginnings of the random roll of the dice of life. The process that takes matter from an inanimate, inanimate state into a living state. And this is Perhaps if this, if this tests out, it'll go down as one of the great images in the history of science. And you're the first to see it. So last year on this stage, I presented this model of how life can begin through wet, dry, and moist cycling in a little pool that dries down. And when I presented it to you, the sludge that forms at the bottom of the pool is the unit at the base of the roots of the tree of life. Turns out it's a communal unit. It's a network effect. So that's a huge philosophical role for us because we don't come from an individual that was competing. We come from a collaborative network of simpler entities. Think about that. So the whole idea of survival of the fittest actually goes out the window. At the same time, uh, this was just published on the cover of Scientific American this time last year, so the world knows about it. And what's happened in the last year is meeting with spiritual teachers, meeting with Deepak, meeting with Ken Wilber, uh, meeting with uh, uh, Jeremy Sherman, uh, Terrence Deacon, and all these people. We're now teasing out of this origin cycle, that little cycle that you saw, the fundamental properties that actually gave rise to everything and we think we found it. It's a theory of everything. It's a system that shapes probability and makes things more probable. 
then it connects them in a network, and then it writes a memory to read later. And we think that this is an explanation for everything, including biology, all the way up into technology, the human experience, and spiritual experience is generated by that system, by that system like a Dorja or like the Tao, completely cycling. We think we might have found that. That's for all for you to evaluate. And that that system goes from physics through biology into the learning environment of neurons and you get enough neurons together and you get self-awareness. And when awareness becomes aware, not only of itself, but its origins, its very origins, then you get a to totality. I wouldn't even call it a non-dual state. You get a totality. When my mind goes back four billion years and I think of those fragile little protocells, the little sludges in the bottoms of the pools in the progenian epoch, I'm rooting for them like a coach. <laughs> it's like, come on guys, you can get to cell division, you can get to cell division, just keep, keep believing. You know, they're not really believing anything, but they're getting hit by asteroid impacts and the whole thing, you know. And I think that it grows up to this what we experience in this room, what, what we've experienced, the state of complete unity in our systems from the lower chakras up. It's the actual story of life itself. But I want to bring you something today uh, that's very personal. And I have to tell you that there's a panic running inside of me because I have a little panic part about all this. And that will come out later. But I think humanity is starting to eat itself, like the Ouroboros that's shown here, the snake that ate its tail. I think we can all feel that. But where did this start from? Why are we driving ourselves crazy with our media, with our story, right? Our story is starting to consume our sanity. Well, perhaps it started if you look at the origins of humans. A femur bone was discovered of this creature about 10 years ago, prosimian, the common ancestor of all apes, primates, uh, monkeys, etc. This is how we lived. We, our deepest ancestry, the origin of the human, is the prosimian. Living as an insectivore way up here in the rainforest canopy, way up here, away from roving raptors, basically. We lived in community balls. We lived in tight, snuggle puddles, pretty much. And I want to tell you a story that might explain how we booted up and how we gained the ability to have conscious experience in the first place. And it goes far back be beyond the humans that you see walking, the proto-humans walking the plains of Africa. So picture a rainforest at dawn, and the light is just coming up. And this little fellow, she's a girl, I call her Overdrive, she peels herself off of the community ball, which are insect-feeding prosimians, because what she sees on the rainforest limb is a ball of tree sap that contains glucose. And we, like it. we have a burger, fries, and a shake diet because we're insectivores. <laughs> and so she creeps out, leaving the community ball so they don't wake up because they'll bust her, and she goes out on the limb to suck down this tree sap at dawn. Why? To get high. To turn on her brain. She, she's doing this. She's sort of like the teenage prosimian. She's sucking this down, and then she looks on the limb, and she sees a patina of squares, a little kind of funny pattern. And she's sort of tripping out. Her, bra her brain is turning on, and like, oh, oh. And her mind's slowly coming to realization, because she can see in color in, with a binocular vision. And what is in front of her is this, waiting for her. The body of a tree snake, the apex predator of our ancestors for 40 million years. For 40 million years. And so the head of the, of the tree serpent or the snake is underneath the limb and is getting ready. If she doesn't move, is getting in position to snap her down. So she either snaps to and realizes the pattern just moved, the body moved, that's danger, but she was tripping out on it before, it was, you know, and then she jumps skyward and the tree, uh, the tree snake 
snaps into the air. And then she runs back and she makes her double. And then her double of her double and her double of her double of her double. And each time our ancestor goes out on a limb in search of the elixirs, the sacred elixir, to open the mind and to get high, let's face it, uh, she faces that serpent. And she's either snapped up or she snaps too. And that's evolution, driving. We are the only creatures that can see with acuity in 3D with pixel patterns. So where does this go? So there she is coming <laughs> into awareness. I just love that psychedelic prosimian sort of. Uh, maybe she's also been eating some of Paul's medicaments. So our brains grow, grow and grow, but the early phase of, of our entire conditioning was a kind of trauma, but it was a kind of skill. Because I'm sure that when she jumped and the snake missed her just by this much, there was a rush. And she went back and reported to her community ball, ha, <laughs> ha, right? Evolving the ball. And in a sense, the rest is history, because this is Artipithecus six million years ago, Artie, who walked on the forest floor and had an opposable thumb. And there is a, a lineup of, of our ancestors' faces. Amazing, right? But most of the evolution was done of the, of the brain. So this was the character that is in all of our myths. If you ha have a snake in front of you on the, on the grass, you jump automatically, right? It's wire hardwired into us. But this, this character in our story made us able to do this. Look at this fresco, Byzantine fresco. We can do things with patterns because we were trained to do things with these patterns. And this is the basis for our entire civilization, this, this ability. And when we take psilocybin mushrooms and we see those visions, it's made by this process. This is the source of it. And it's the source of this. So what we have done what we have done is we have made a system that mesmerizes us on the tree limb. We may be sucking down our, our medicaments, and we're, we're standing with our cell phone, and we're worried about this. We're worried and getting more worried, and our bodies go still, and we stop breathing, and we start panicking, and our heart rate changes, and anxiety comes in. We've created the serpent. The serpent's with us. It's called technology. It's called the phone. It's called all of our media. And something is coiling through the serpent that then goes around us and is extracting from us. But it's a creation of us, and it involves us too. But it can be fatal. So the serpent is us, and we have made it. So this is a story of what do you do about this? Because we have made a beautiful world. We have made a spectacular world. They say that 2013 was one of the best times in human history. Right, for, for health and for communication and for the lack of violence and things like this. Like, but we're not convinced that it is. We're told another story. You know, Charles was just talking about this. But that serpent, that fake news, that panic, that anxiety that is designed to mesmerize and extract could kill all this. It could destroy this infrastructure that we've worked so long, medical care, transportation. This used to be our world, the world of the rainforest. We are now 98% of the plant, of the animal body mass is in human bodies and, and animal pets and livestock. It used to be the other way around. There, there's only 2% wild left. It is the anthro Anthropocene. So we are the drivers of evolution. But this is what is happening in our evolution, right here. Huh? This is what's happening. This is a huge evolutionary factor that is the return of the serpent. So what do we do? And it coils around us. You know, the, the rates of anxiety, the rates of sleep deprivation, it's a huge epidemic. I call it the great unplanned experiment on all of you when this technology was launched. It's the largest laboratory rat maze experiment ever carried out. If you tried to get a human uh, research subject trial in 1972, which I, did, I didn't, but if you tried it where you said, we're going to take people from ages three or four or five all the way up and we're going to have them force look at a glowing box with an instruction on it 
like 300 times a day, right? They would say that that would be absurd, that would be t torture. But now we are all doing it. <laughs> Looking at that box, breaking our attention. But something else is driving this, and it's something that is deep within, and the previous speaker just talked about this. It's actually the little parts inside. It's the little children that didn't get hurt. So in the process of us becoming human, there's little parts that get hurt. And this is sometimes called parts work, it's sometimes called the pain body, internal family systems. It's a huge driver of human behavior. And we are now coming into the era when we know how to work with these parts. We know how to talk to these parts. And we know how to help the beings give the parts the thing that they didn't get. And so here's, here's an example from Burning Man of a couple not facing each other in some argument and their inner children are reaching out. All of you here, I consider in this room to be Jedi. You're a Jedi because you understand this system. You understand how people boot up and how they work. You can see inside, you're shamans, you can see inside those, those little beautiful parts, those tendrils of, of little children, and you know how to talk to them. You know how to bring them out, how to give them permission to come out. Despite the being that developed as the adult, there's other beings. So you are a new kind of Jedi. And in the Star Wars, and made right here in the Bay Area, this is our parable, right? What happens? Luke has the saber battle with Darth Vader, the great symbol of empire. Defeats Darth, and then what does Darth say? Luke, take off my, this mask, my mask. And look what Luke finds. This being, my God. When theater audiences showed this, were showed this, they, they were showed something very powerful. The sensitive, broken being. The empire, the very embodiment of the empire, getting a healing from a Jedi, from his very son. Because Luke was his, uh, Je Darth was Luke's father. So you all carry inside you an inner kindergarten. And so does everyone on this planet. So does the people we like to talk about a lot that we don't think we like. They carry an inner kindergarten. If we have empathy for that kindergarten, if we talk to that kindergarten, we can soften their systems. And this is the work of the Jedi. So uh, Master Yoda, I had a conversation with him. I said, what would you do right now? You know, he said, this current empire not built on armies. This new empire built on colonizing consciousness. I said, well, what do we do about it? Remember the snake. Remember how you were made. The snake is beautiful. The snake taught you and made you what you are. Look in the eye of the snake. Respect the snake. He made you into spiritual beings. But then return to your ball. Return to your community ball. You humans call them puppy piles, I think. <laughs> Touch each other. Because if you are alone, you are prey. If you feel isolated, you are prey to the snake of your own making, inside and outside. So in leaving Yoda in his forest dwelling, getting back into my X-wing, I said, uh, do you have any final words for us? I'm going back to Earth to talk to some beautiful people. And he said, human, become, become. And may the force be with you. <laughs> Thank you.